Hello, everyone. Before I start talking about the mandibular nerve, I want to show this case that Ben notified me by email soon after you read it last Wednesday. Ben did an excellent job in, this, in his preliminary report describing in detail the perineural spread to many of the maxillary nerve and other trigeminal structures that I talked about last week. So here's a patient with a large facial mass. We see the erosion of the infraorbital foramen. We see thickening of the infraorbital nerve below the globe. Here we see again the erosion of the infraorbital nerve. Note the widening of the pterygopalatine fossa. And if we compare the foramen rotundum on both sides, note that the one on the left side is larger and has erosion of the walls. And again, here we see on the CT the involvement of the cavernous sinus. The MR that followed showed, again, these findings. Note the enhancement and enlargement of the infraorbital nerve. Note the enlargement and dense and enhanced the infraorbital nerve as it courses towards the foramen or tandem. And this sagittal view shows, uh, shows the thickening of the infraorbital nerve and the roof of the maxillary sinus, the tissue, abnormal tissue, and the pterygopalatine fossa, and even, as uh, Ben noted, involvement down towards the palatine canal. And we can see it also in this coronal view, although because of rotation, it looks lateral to the sinus. And again, here it is. Uh, and, and going towards the foramen rotundum. And again, here's the foramen rotundum enhancing. Here it is on the axial plane. We can even see it on the sagittal plane. And the most important thing even here, we can see involvement of the cisternal portion of the fifth nerve and, and also tracking along within the pons along the course of the trigeminal nerve from the ganglion, I mean from the nucleus. And this patient was biopsied and uh, the biopsy showed the lymphoproliferative disorder. And last, to introduce the today's talk, we see involvement of the mandibular nerve both on the coronal and on the axial plane all the things that I mentioned in my last talk on the maxillary nerve. Now we've seen this uh, image before showing the, the trigeminal nerve. We already talked, ab I talked about the olfactory last week about the maxillary and today I'm going to be talking about the mandibular nerve which we can see here going through the foramen or valley. We can see the region of the foramen or valley here on, in the floor of the middle fossa in, in the posterior part of the greater wing of the sphenoid. And here on the specimen, the foramen or valley as we look from above. Uh, note again on this radiograph of uh, isolated sphenoid, here's the foramen or valley just in front and more medial to the frame spinosum for the middle meningeal artery. And here again is the foramen uh, or valley. We can see the mandibular division. Now, we can see the foramen or valley uh, in the coronal CT at the level of the dorsum cellae. On MR, uh, we can see it here outlined uh, we can see the mandibular nerve going through the foramen or valley outlined by the cortical margin of the foramen or valley that we can also see here on the specimen. Here's the little marrow. This is the foramen or valley with the mandibular nerve going through, through it. Now, I just, again, want to show you 
This is Meckel's cave full of CSF. And if we look at the specimen, here's Meckel's cave just behind and slightly lateral to the vascular cavernous sinus. Here's the Meckel's cave in uh, the coronal plane on a T2. Now, if you remember this slide, I drew a green line separating the regional Meckel's cave from the true cavernous sinus. The mandibular nerve, or the third division of the trigeminal, exits the, this region through the foramenal valley within Meckel's cave. It never reaches the cavernous sinus. And again, here's a green line separating Meckel's cave with the mandibular nerve from the, and more anteriorly, the other nerves within the uh, cavernous sinus. Again, here's the mandibular nerve exiting through the foramenal valley, Meckel's cave, and this is the cavernous sinus. So again, if we look at the coronal view, as I showed before when I was talking about the cavernous sinus, we can see the third nerve in the wall of the cavernous sinus, the fourth, the sixth below the carotid, V1 and V2. V3 is not part of the cavernous sinus. And again, if we look at this coronal MR, the third, the fourth, here's uh, the sixth with V1 and V2, and V3, or the mandibular nerve, is coming out. And again, in this coronal image, we see V1, V2, but V3, or the mandibular nerve, is already out, going through the foraminal valley. Now, one of the ways to try to identify the position of the mandibular nerve in the foramen valley is to look at, at the carotid arteries. If we look at this diagram here, we see the carotid arteries as they go vertically from the temporal bone to enter the cavernous sinus. And at this level where we see this kind of vertical position of the carotids is where the foramenal valley and the mandibular nerve would be. So if you look here, this is here the vertical portion of the carotids, and Meckel's cave is laterally to it, and we see at the same level the mandibular nerve going through the foramenal valley. Again, Meckel's cave here and the carotid arteries. This is really a true course of the mandibular nerve. It makes a little bit of an angle here which is not uh, drawn correctly on this uh, uh, diagram here. Okay, first question, what's wrong with this patient? Correct, there's been an ASIF, say, fibrous dysplasia, but why am I showing this case? Correct. Nate, Nate and Eric, <coughs> excuse me, uh, and the guests say there's compression, correct. Here's a normal foramen ovale in spinosum, and notice marked uh, compression of the foramen ovale. And this patient, this was a 13-year-old girl with fibrous dysplasia and had right V3 motor and sensory symptoms. You can see the, on this color image the marked deformity due to the fibrous dysplasia. And again, we can see the frame of spinosum behind there. This was an interesting case. Here we see the patient was being followed in July. It looks pretty good. However, in September, which was not noticed, that the frame of valley was getting a little larger and it was finally noted on 
their study of October a few months later. And this patient all along had symptoms, had left facial pain. The patient has, has carcinoma of the tongue. And again, the progressive enlargement of the foramen ovale and erosion of the margin. One of the problems with the thin CTs is that sometimes the slide obliquity will not show both foramen ovale on the same slice. Here you can see how much larger this is compared to this one, but that doesn't always uh, happen. But like in this study, you don't see really the right foramen ovale. And of course, we also see some changes, which I think I showed before in another talk, that here we have in July a normal CSF full Meckel's cave. Notice here there's tissue within Meckel's cave. Again, this was not noted. And progressively, even more tissue with expansion of Meckel's cave on the October study. And we even see the abnormal tissue uh, going in the cisternal portion involving the trigeminal nerve right in this location. Which side is the abnormality here? Correct. As Ben says, the left, unfortunately, again, the right is not shown because of the thinness of the slice and some obliquity. And we, what do we see now in the coronal MR? Correct. As Asif said and Ben, thickening and enlargement of the mandibular nerve going through the foramen of valley. This patient had a melanoma of the lower lip and perineural spread to involve the mandibular nerve as seen here. Obviously here we have a very large foramen of valley. The right one is barely seen. Okay, if on the MR, what do we see? And what may that be? Correct, there's an enlargement and enhancement of the nerve, possible diagnoses. Correct, as Rich said, a nerve sheath tumor would be uh, a high possibility here. And uh, again, we can see it on various planes, the enhancement. And although we did, this was not operated on, but we felt like that this is a likely a nerve sheath tumor. Another case showing enlargement and some erosion of the left foramen of alley. Large lesion. Very large lesion. Actually the tip of the iceberg is what is enlarging the foramen of alley and projecting a little bit into the... Was a possible diagnosis here? There was surgery. Anybody? Correct. Is Nate and Rich said cystic uh, schwannoma. This was a nerve sheath tumor was operated on and again has this typical things that we see in the cerebellopontine angle for 
vestibular schwannoma, there's sometimes they'll be partially cystic, which we can see here. This is a massive lesion of a malignant schwannoma, again, a massive uh, lesion and involved in a masticator space and the, you know, nasopharynx, but again, projecting through the foramen of valley, which is not enlarged in this case. Okay, what is the abnormality here and a possible diagnosis? Correct. As Nate says, an enlarged, massively enlarged foramen of valley seen on the coronal CT compared to the opposite side and also seen here on the sagittal, a view that we don't usually uh, look at for the foramen of valley. Possible diagnoses here. This is a young patient, a child. Paraganglioma is mentioned, neuroblastoma met, not uh, definitely in the differential. Whoever the guest is mentioned the right diagnosis. This was a, a rhabdomyosarcoma in a child, I think it was four years old. Another case, which side is abnormality on? Correct, as Rich said, left. Mark the erosion of the temple bone and the clivus. Another massive lesion. And this again was a rhabdomyosarcoma in a child. Now, here we have an enlarged, expanded foramen of valley. We can see it both on the CT and also on the MR. Both uh, regions of Meckel's cave are expanded. Uh, what's the possible diagnosis here? Correct. Er, uh, Eric mentioned cephaloceles. It's true, we can see those with cephaloceles, but this, this was a case of NF, uh, neurofibromatosis, you remember, which has dorolactasia and also can involve the foramina uh, in, the, in the calvarium. Another case of an enlarged uh, foramen of valley, a little prominent of Meckel's cave here. There's also some, maybe some enlargement of the uh, foramen rotundum. Another diagnosis? There, anybody? One of the five we have to mention when we see enlargement of the nerve root sleeves in the spine. Schwannoma and F correct, but this was something else. This is a case of Marfans. Remember that Marfans is in the differential. Okay, now normally we will see the trigeminal nerve uh, surrounded by the rich perivascular uh, spaces around it. Sometimes, not only we will see the main mandibular nerve, but we may also see the divisions in the coronal plane. 
So here, for instance, we can see, if you look at this uh, diagram from Netter, try, try to find something similar. So medially is the lingual nerve, and laterally is the inferior alveolar nerve. And we can see here, so this would be the lingual, and this would be the inferior alveolar nerve. And again, we can see the division here a little further down. And again, uh, people have identified these two nerves on an axial T2. So if we look at the relationship on the sagittal diagram, we can see this would be the, the inferior alveolar nerve posteriorly and on the sagittal view, and the lingual is more anteriorly. And here we can see two nerves, very tiny, and this would be the inferior alveolar and the lingual would be in front in this uh, space. Now, when you have abnormalities of the mandibular nerve, most of the time you'll kind of lose, here's the case of meningioma, although you still get a suggestion of the fibers, but you get this kind of homogeneous enhancement and enlargement of the mandibular nerve. This was a case of adenocystic, Again, notice the involvement uh, at the regional meckel cave. Again, here's the vertical portion of the carotids, and here's, again, the mandibular nerve may be outlined, but this is enlarged and enhancing. So you lose this kind of distinction that you normally would see. Okay, what am I showing here? Correct. As Ben says, an enlarged foramen or valley was markedly abnormal enhancement. And here's the cause of it. Again, a large enhancing mandibular nerve going through the foramen or valley. And this is, we should be able to identify it on the ax axial plane. And this was, again, a melanoma. Uh, that spread perineurally to involve the mandibular nerve. And again, do you remember I showed this case before of the lymphoproliferative disorder? And again, here's the man enlarged mandibular nerve with all this abnormal tissue in the subtemporal region. And here again is the mandibular nerve to the foramen or valley seen on the, on the axial plane. Here's another case of a melanoma met. Look, the mark thickening here in the region of Meckel caves and the thickened uh, mandibular nerve. You can see here the thickened mandibular nerve with the enhancement surrounding it. Uh, and here it is, again, the foramen or valley region. Notice this uh, enhanced and large nerve on the axial plane. And here's some other abnormalities involving the mandibular nerve. This was a patient with lymphoma presented with proptosis because of the involvement of the orbital apex, but we also see the involvement of the mandibular nerve uh, as it goes through the foramen or valley. Two separate patients. What is involving both mandibular nerves? a disease that I always have to mention and that you should always think about. Lymphoma, melanoma, interesting, but not the case, not these cases. Could look like that, sarcoid, I guess. Anything else? Correct. Rich, remember, always Lyme, Lyme. This was two separate patients 
was Lyme disease and ex extent multiple nerve involvement in both mandibular nerves are involved here. Uh, and here we see Meckel's cave involved in the left. Man so always have the Lyme in the differential, at least something we can treat. And this was an interesting case. This was a, a squamous of the sphenoid sinus that expanded laterally into Meckel's cave and then involved the mandibular nerve, as we can see here. What's the possible diagnosis here? An unusual case in this adult? We have the usual differential. Everything looks like that. It, no, it, it was not herpes, not lymphoma. I already showed lymphoma. I won't belabor that, but this was, a, again, a rhabdo in an adult simulating very much all the other conditions that we talk about. And this is a case that I showed before when I talked about the cavernous sinus. This patient actually came in with a headache and a few weeks before had this uh, pharyngitis that was involving the masticator space and actually extended superiorly along the mandibular nerve. Notice all this enhancement around the mandibular nerve was an enlargement of the cavernous sinus and Meckel's cave region. So this was really a case of a thrombosis of the cavernous sinus. We can see the, the compression of the carotid here, com the size compared to the right, and here's the compressed carotid on on the involved side, although this patient did not have any neurologic deficits. It was a young patient. So remember, infection can also extend up to involve the mandibular nerve and the cavernous sinus and Meckel's cave. Here we have a normal foramen ovale here we only see part of it, but it looks enlarged. This was a nasopharyngeal carcinoma, not the size of the lesion. Again, direct extension upward to the foramen and valley to involve Meckel's cave and the cavernous sinus. You can see the marked involvement here of the trigeminal nerve on this side. And this I've shown before, the idiopathic hypertrophic pachymeningitis, which involves the dura in multiple locations, remember in the orbit, posterior fossa, but also involved here the mandibular nerve. Here we have abnormal involvement of the left mandibular nerve and enhancement along the meninges in the subarachnoid spaces, an unusual case, any diagnoses? Correct. Nate already, the first diagnosis he wrote down, he wrote the diagnosis, which this is. Anybody, anything? Nate already has a diagnosis, but this was a case of TB, has all this involvement of the basal cistern, and this was a likely TB meningitis, patient had POTS disease. This is a very unusual case that RJ brought to my attention, and notice the marked thickening here of the mandibular nerve bilaterally. Here the right on the left, here they are on the foramen or valley region bilaterally. Patient also had thickening of, there may be V2 bilaterally. Also enhancement and enlargement uh, in, the, in the foramina, uh, in the upper, in the cervical spine. Also had a 
partially split cervical cord. And look, look at the size of the ganglia here in the lumbar uh, region on the axial T2. And on this coronal, we think thickened nerve. And again, look at these ganglia. And the differential when we see this is usually NF, or you may have hereditary motor and sensory neuropathy, which is called HA, HMSN, or chronic inflammatory disease, demyelinating polyneuropathy. This patient had no symptoms. Oh, this whole study was done because the patient had what they were worried about central adrenal uh, deficiency, and the patient came for a pituitary study. And all these findings in the brain uh, were found, and then the patient had a spine. But patient was, was not followed, so we don't know what the true diagnosis is. But at the time, patient had no symptoms. So it just was read out as hypertrophic polyneuropathy. Okay, now some anatomy. The mandibular division, the mandibular nerve, has a number of sensory branches. The auricular temporal nerve, the buccal nerve, and then the lingual, and the inferior alveolar nerve, which is a mixed. So all the rest are sensory, and the inferior alveolar nerve is, part, is a mixed nerve, has sensory and motor. The sensory is to supply the teeth, the mandible, mental region, and lower lip. The auricular temporal nerve is very important. We can see here it's two branches come off the main division of the, the main trunk of the mandibular nerve, and the middle meningeal artery goes between the two trunks. The nerve then travels. This is a coronal view. So here are the two uh, nerves combining to form the auricular temporal nerve that goes behind the mandible, behind the condyle here, or the ramus of the mandible. And again, the middle meningeal artery goes between these two. On the sagittal view, we can see the distribution of the auricular temporal nerve uh, and here's a diagram, the area is covered, that it covers on the scalp. The, the important part is here, and that relates to the region where the parotid gland is. Now, Netta, beautifully, I only noticed that last night when I was blowing up this image. The reason, and the problem is that in a parotid, there are all these branches coming off the facial nerve, and also the branches coming from the trigeminal via the auricular temporal nerve, and they intermingle. So tumors in the parotid could go either to the facial nerve branches perineurally or to the trigeminal, and because of this communication. And I guess Netta could not show these very fine branches, but he shows this connection between the facial nerve and the trigeminal nerve, which you see these little branches. So this is why this nerve is so important for perineural spread of tumor. Here's a diagram showing again the fibers as they go behind the mandible. What side is abnormal in this case? So far, I got the wrong answer. Okay, Nate, Rich, got the left, the correct answer. It's the left. Notice the mandible here, enhancing tissue behind it, nothing behind the right. Over here, it's very important uh, to, on the non-contrast, to look 
behind. You should never see tissue behind the ramus of the mandible. Notice here is just fat. Here's some soft tissue. This patient had a squamous of the left cheek. So again, involved likely the facial nerve, but also involved the, the trigeminal fibers and via the auricotemporal nerve st started traveling centrally and this time involving. So again, here the normal, the fibers would be here. So this is definitely abnormal. It's important to look in this area, especially if patient present had a skin lesion of some sort of a skin tumor and has TMJ symptoms or has hearing problems because many times these patients will present with these symptoms. And here we see the, the involvement of the region of the auricular temporal nerve. What side is abnormality on, in this case? Correct, as Eric says, Rich says, left. Again, notice on the right, ramus of the mandible, nothing abnormal looking. Look at the abnormal enhancement over here, involving the region of the auricular temporal nerve. This patient had a left facial squamous and presented with facial palsy and pain. Facial palsy is facial nerve, but unfortunately, this was not what happened here. Patient had facial palsy involving the facial nerve, but look at the extensive perineural spread that started by involving the auricular temporal nerve. So again, the region of the auricular temporal nerve, but this is now spread perineurally, went up like, into the mandibular nerve, involving now the cavernous sinus, and again, now here's the enhanced thickened uh, maxillary, the infraorbital nerve, look at the enlargement of the infraorbital nerve here, and look at the enhancement of the foramen rotundum. So this is perineural spread from the skin via the auricular temporal nerve to the mandibular nerve and the rest of the trigeminal nerve. Okay, let's move on. Uh, I'm only going to focus on two areas of the mandible, and that is the mandibular foramen and the mental foramen. This is the region of the mandibular foramen. It's very important. There's all these foramina normally have fat pads or in the where the nerves are surrounded by some fat as they enter, in this case, the mandible. So it's important to look for that, although we don't see it on this side, but this is normally what it will look like. All, in all the regions where they're like, the infraorbital foramen, uh, there's fat and the pterygopalatine fossa. So many of the foramina will have the fat, which is a good indicator of normality here. Here on CT, we can see the entry to the uh, mandibular foramen. And we can identify the mandibular canal with the mandibular nerve within it. So here, for instance, here's an axial uh, uh, MR, and we can see the nerve within the mandibular canal here, just portion of it. Here it is as it enters, and we see more of it here and here it ex exits to the mental foramen. We can identify also the mental foramen on this thin T2 axial CT. We can even see it here on the, on the coronal CT, and on the sagittal CT we see the mental foramen here. And here we can see again on the Sagittal, we can see the canal. Uh, this is, uh, I have not have found a case so far in our files, but here's a case. There's a large destructive mass. The literature, the, the author doesn't mention what this was, 
but we can see the erosion within the mandibular canal and look at the erosion and the tumor coming out through the mental foramen to involve the soft tissue in this region. So this again would be in this location. Now the first time I saw this, I, this was a trauma case, I saw it was fractured. This is the lingua, the little piece of bone in the region of the mandibular foramen. But on very thin cuts, it will look like it's, like it's not connected. But this, this is normal because if you look very carefully, you will see a little bit of connection. But you see it's a very thin structure, so it may appear as if it was broken off. So it's called the lingula of the mandible. What do we see here? What side is the lesion on? Okay. Correct. There's a large mass. Is Asif said Dan? Possible diagnoses? People mention sarcoma. I don't think it looks very destructive. Look at, this is kind of boring here. It, I would think, I would not think of a sarcoma right off the bat. I mean, this has been there for a long time, causing this kind of deformity. And as Asif said, and Nate said, here we see it on MR, a little bit of involvement of the mandibular canal. This was a mas masticator space schwannoma. Again, I mean, it's been there a long time deforming the mandible, which we can even see uh, on this plane films, and it's been here a long time. So this was a schwannoma, not a sarcoma. Okay, what side is the abnormality here? Rich, Asif, Ben, all point to the left. What's wrong on the left side? What's wrong is that we lost the normal marrow of the mandible. Here's a normal mandible on this side with the fat. This is all grayed out. Not only that, but we have a tissue here in the region of the mandibular foramen. Notice again the fat here next to the bony mandible we see. There's a soft tissue mass here. Again, on the coronal lo loss of fat of the mandible, and obvious on the contrast, a large mass uh, medial to the mandible, invasion of the mandible here uh, of the mandibular canal, and this large enhancing mass. This was a metastatic lesion from the lung. Again, Again, notice the normal region of the mandibular can foramen. And again, even on CT, we can identify the abnormalities. Here we see a lesion in the region of uh, Meckel's cave. Remember the dorsum here and a large foramen of valley. And we see this uh, thickened mandibular nerve and if we compare here, look at the enlargement and the erosion in the region of the mandibular foramen compared to the opposite side. And this diagram shows, you know, this kind of lesion here in this location and inv invading the uh, 
mandible and traveling perineurally and expanding their mandibular nerve. Here's a melanoma, perineural spread. But interestingly, the mandible looks okay here, but here we see the thickened uh, enhancement of the mandibular nerve traveling towards Meckelscave. This was scamus of the left cheek. Again, perineural spread. Notice invasion of the mandible at the level of the mandibular foramen and enhancement and again enhancement and involvement of the mandibular nerve. What is the condition here? What is this uh, condition this patient has? Markedly enlarged foramen of alley, enlarged mandibular foramen, large nerve here. Can we think of something? Young patient. not think of a like sarcoma right off. This was a plexiform neurofibroma in F NF1. I mean, we've seen that in other parts, this is just uh, NF1 with the plexiform neurofibroma causing this expansion of the foramen valley in the mandibular for a minute here. The, he will see an expanding lesion within the mandible involving the mandibular canal and any possible diagnosis here, but I won't spend too much time. This ended up kind of an unusual lesion. That's why it was written up. This is a lymphoma presenting within the mandible eroding uh, involving the canal. Okay, we've got to continue now with some more branches. We've talked about the sensory, now we have a motor. We have the motor division for the muscles of mastication, and then we have the tensor valley palatini and tensor tympani muscles. So here we can see these are the divisions supplying the muscles of mastication. But then we have the two other ones, which is the tensor valley palatini nerve, which supplies the tensor, I'm sorry, the tensor tympani nerve supplying the tempo tensor, uh, tensor tympani muscle. And then we have the tensor valley palatini nerve su supplying the muscle. Now, you may think, why bother? But Everything sooner or later will be shown, so might as well start thinking about that. If you ever need to, you can go back to Netter to look at what we're looking. Here's, for instance, this was a paper uh, in AJNR uh, that just came out this year showing they try to visualize, from Japan, visualizing some of these branches. And here they're pointing out the masseteric nerve and this is the, the this is another branch here coming off the main trunk. So I was sorry, this is the buccal branch and the masseteric branch coming off the main trunk. And if we look here, here's the main mandibular division. So this is the masseteric branch branch. See here's the masseter muscle which has been cut and this would be the buccal. So people are starting to identify these various small branches on MR imaging. 
Now, the tensor tympani never muscle. The nerve has never really been identified. Neither has the muscle because it's so tiny. We only can see where it would be sitting. Here's this beautiful d detailed image in this paper by Davidson uh, showing that this was where the temper tensor tympani muscle would sit in this location. But the muscle itself uh, and the nerve have never been uh, identified so far in imaging. But this is different. The tensor tympani and nerve, again, has not been identified, but the muscle can be identified on MR, although it's a very small muscle. It looks big here. If we look at this diagram here, uh, we can see this, this is the tensor valley palatini muscle. a very little strip here sitting uh, lateral to the torus tuberis. And if we look at these pictures here, this is the tensor valley palatini muscles we can see here. Again, lateral to the torus. And here it is on a T2 image. And if we look hard enough, we can see it. So this is the tensor valley palatini muscles that we can see. So again, here's the torus tuberis. This is the muscle. And just to show, but you have to look hard for it. This is a patient who had METS from a melanoma. Look at the mark thitting, thick, thickening of the in the region of the macroscave and the mandibular nerve. And this patient had denervation atrophy. This is a normal tensor tympani. And usually in denervation, which I'll t go more in detail when I talk about denervation. But this is fatty replacement of the uh, tensor belly palatini, which causes problems with the soft palate but this is denervation atrophy of this tiny muscle. Okay, now we have to finish with the inferior alveolar nerve, which is a mixed nerve. Uh, has a motor division for the mylohyoid. So here, so again, this was the lingual nerve, and this is the inferior alveolar nerve, which has been cut off here, but before it gets cut off here, it gives off the, the branch with the motor branch for the, that's, the, that's called the mylohyoid nerve that supplies the mylohyoid muscle and also the anterior belly of the digastric. And if we look here again, so again, this is the lingual nerve and this is the inferior alveolar nerve. So this is the mylohyoid branch that comes off before the inferior alveolar nerve enters the foramen. And here again is from this paper showing this is the entry of the inferior alveolar nerve into the canal. Uh, and this is the, the lingual nerve. So people are now looking at these and high-resolution special technique MRs. And here's, for instance, look at this image of the mandible showing here's the inferior alveolar nerve within the mandibular canal. This, and here, here are some of the fibers going to the individual, individual teeth. This is the tooth, the crown, and here the nerve coming off the inferior alveolar nerve to supply the tooth. And here's a case that had a malignant schwannoma of the inferior alveolar nerve. What, do, what does this image show? 
What is involved here? Correct. As Asif said, denervation atrophy. What muscles are involved? As Dan said, and Asif both said and Rich all mentioned the correct structure. This is denervation atrophy secondary to this malignant schwannoma. Here's the normal right-sided anterior belly with the digastric, and here's the mylohyoid. Notice we don't even see the mylohyoid here, and there's atrophy, denervation atrophy of the left anterior belly. So this is again uh, because of this involvement. So again, this is the the lesion must have been higher up, but it involved this uh, mylohyoid nerve. Notice that travels down to supply the anterior belly, the digastric, and the mylohyoid muscle. And that's why you end up with this uh, atrophic denervation, atrophy of these two muscles. And this is the last case I'm going to be showing today. Thank you for your attention.